Once again, welcome and thank you so much for joining us this evening in our final Mid-Coast Audubon program of the season. We will be back with more in the fall, uh, but for now we are going to enjoy a talk about horseshoe crabs. And we are very pleased to have uh, Sarah Gladu here from um, Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust. But before we meet her, we are going to meet Kit Pfeiffer, who's here this evening representing Mid-Coast Audubon. Kit, take it away. Yeah, super, thanks, Julia. I want to give you just a very brief introduction if you're not familiar with Midcoast Audubon and what we do in addition to these monthly programs. We are all volunteer and we offer free birding trips um, and we hope to get together again soon to do all of that up and down the state. There are several local preserves. Do look on our website and consider visiting them. You know, the warblers are coming back. Great place to go and see them. We have scholarships for individuals to attend um, uh, special natural history programs. And we also have free birding stations for schools and libraries. So find out if your local library or school would like to participate in that program. We'd love to have you. What would I do if I didn't have to plug the organization? We all love our organizations and we're run on membership dues. So if you're not a member, consider becoming one. It helps in so, so many ways. So for Sarah Gladue, who is speaking tonight, I have two introductions. First, a formal one. Sarah has created and run many educational programs for citizen science and natural history at the Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust for over 15 years. And before that, she worked for the main cooperative extension running statewide water quality programs. Her academic credentials for this work include a BA in environmental policy from Brandeis and a master in environmental learning and leadership from the University of Minnesota. That being said, now for a less formal introduction, Sarah has an engaging teaching style and a deep knowledge of the natural world. I've learned lots of cool stuff from her in walks and Zoom on boats during citizen science. And best of all, my granddaughter and my grandnephews are all alumni of Camp Mamachug at, uh, at the uh, uh, Conservation Trust, which Sarah runs. So thank you, Sarah, for being such an important mentor to me and many others of us who care about the natural world. Now we look forward to hearing what you have to say about those amazing horseshoe crabs in Salt Bay, Great Salt Bay. It's all yours wow. now. Thank you, Kit. That was quite an introduction. And Kit is one of the dear friends who is also a naturalist. And um, so it's fun to be around her to share all these things that we love. And thank you to the Camden Public Library for, for hosting this. It's a great partnership between the three organizations really to bring um, all kinds of opportunities to the public, which was great a great forum. So thank you for that. And uh, let's launch into our horseshoe crab program. I'm now gonna share my screen so that you can see the slides I have for us tonight. Someone give me a thumbs up that you can see that. Yep, looks good. All right, super, okay. Wanted to thank you. Thanks for the thumbs up. Wonderful. So horseshoe crabs in the Damascata River estuary, which is really where I'm based in terms of my work. Um, and I started uh, some time ago with the volunteer monitoring program to to learn about horseshoe crabs and that was really my personal you know uh entry into learning about horseshoe crabs i knew about some other marine life but um horseshoe crabs are pretty extraordinary and so i'm glad to be able to have this opportunity to share them with you they are ancient creatures eurypterids are the ancestors of today's horseshoe crabs and the organism that you see in the centermost part of the slide there, this is an artist rendition of a Eurypterid. They could be several meters long, three meters or so, and they kind of would swim through the ocean um, with an undulating, an undulating uh, type of, of movement. And uh, I don't think I'd want to encounter one if I was swimming. They're, they're pretty extraordinary. The, the picture on the upper corner left um, is a is obviously a fossil uh, remains. And the bottom right is just to give you some sense of what some of the other organisms would have looked like when the Eurypterids were swimming in the oceans. This is, you know, some 40, 450 plus million years ago. So 
the, the ancestors uh, of the horseshoe crabs um, gradually changed and evolved with the changing oceans, changing uh, conditions and, and also changing um, co-inhabitants, other organisms that were living in the oceans, of course. So as they did, they, they became much more like the horseshoe crabs of today. And those organisms, as we know them, have been pretty much unchanged for the past 250 million years. There are several species of horseshoe crabs and um, the, the map on the bottom there shows you the, the species of horseshoe crabs and where they're located. So the horseshoe crab that we have here along the eastern um, seaboard, the eastern part of um, North America, extends all the way down into the Gulf of Mexico. And I think that's more far reaching than some people realize, but they've lived and they continue to live all throughout this region in, in varying quantities. And we'll talk about their population ups and downs over time. So let's just sort of start about talking about what a horseshoe crab is, what its parts are, how it functions. Um, we'll go talk a little bit about its life cycle and um, we will continue and talk a little bit about some of the population trends and um, wrap up talking about some of the changes in horseshoe crab um, populations currently. So when you look at a horseshoe crab, and many of you may have found live ones or, or deceased ones or the shed exoskeletons, they do shed their exoskeleton pretty frequently during their lifetime. Um, when they're tiny, when they're babies, they can shed it up to 16 times a year. And as they grow, they molt it less and less often. The upper image there shows you the top and the bottom of the horseshoe crab. So you can see it's got compound eyes where um, you see it, when you look at them, it looks like just a bump, or, you know, in the in the exoskeleton. But it actually the, the exoskeleton has a it's basically like a screen. It's like looking through a screen door where it's got a mesh covering that protects the eye itself. And then you've got several parts to the body. Um, the cephalothorax is the front part. The middle part is the abdomen and the telson is that tail-like structure. A lot of people think that the telson is dangerous and it might hurt them or sting them and horseshoe crabs um, can't really injure you. They, they don't have any mechanisms for, um, for uh, stinging or, or um, impaling anybody. The, the um, telson is really primarily used for when they get tossed about by the waves and then they're upside down and the telson is what they use themselves to prop themselves back up in the sand or on the beach and flip themselves back over. And when you turn the horseshoe crab over, it's got um, some the first walking leg and then it's got um, three additional walking legs and then what they call the pusher leg, which has sort of a, a shovel-like appendage on the bottom, which is the horseshoe crabs use for digging to hide themselves and the females use for creating a nest. The very front most, um, they're, they're not legs, um, they're really feeder claws and they're short. And so this is how when the horseshoe crab wants to feed itself, it shoves food into its mouth, but the mouth isn't in the front of its head. The mouth is in um, kind of the centermost part of its body. So it's actually moving the, the food down towards its belly. Very efficient, you know, to have your mouth close to your belly. Um, and um, then you can see right in the drawing, um, below the, the mouth area, it's got a set of book gills. The book gills are an ancient form of gill and um, they're kind of like book plates of a book or, or pages. And the the horseshoe crabs will use those not only for fluttering to breathe and extract oxygen out of the water, but also for swimming. They can swim. I've seen them frequently, uh, especially the Dermascata, when they want to move around, they flip over and then they flutter those gills and they swim on their backs. And you can actually watch them propel themselves uh, through the water that way. The first walking leg of the male has those, um, if you look in the center of that upper drawing, it has sort of a boxing glove type shape to it. And that's how you identify a male. They tend to be smaller than the females. And the female, that first leg, instead of having that boxing glove or, or mitten 
kind of shape to the to the um, uh, the front appendage there. It has a just a, a clasper. Um, and so that's a part of how you identify males and females from each other. Interestingly, they have 10 eyes, um, although not all those eyes are compound eyes. Only the two sort of most prominent on either side of the cephalothorax are the, are the, the, the uh, compound eyes. The compound eye is basically many lenses uh, put together, much like what an insect has. And then the brain has to assemble that image into something that is useful to the, or, to the animal. The other eyes um, on the Telson, for example, uh, are, all, are all different types of photoreceptors. And so they're sensing light and dark. And this is really helpful to an animal that is scurrying around um, in the muck at the bottom of the ocean, the bottom of the estuary and um, maybe sometimes covered with seaweed, sometimes covered with sediment. And um, they're primarily looking for their, their food, of course, is, is what they're looking for in the, in the muck. And they do this with receptors that are um, all along the, the underside of them. So they're tasting what they're encountering. And they're looking for small bivalves, mostly clams, and also, um, uh, worms, there are a variety of marine worms like ribbon worms and blood worms and so forth. And so that's what they're looking to eat. There's an image here just showing you the basic um, gut of the organism and um, how it's just um, right through the center of, of the animal. There's a digestive tract and then um, uh, and, and it's pretty rudimentary. It's pretty, it's, but it's effective. So. And here's a little bit more so you can see these are photos instead of drawings to give you a little bit better image of what you actually look at. Um, so it has those little feeder claws that can position food right into the mouth in the center of the body, legs, and then the book gills. Um, and, that, and that's basically how, how they look, of course, when you, when you find them and they're walking around. And the topmost image there is the uh, male, just to show you the difference again in the, in the claws structure. So these animals are most closely related not to crabs at all, even though we call them crabs, but to spiders and other arachnids. And um, one of the reasons why that scientists have lumped, this, lumped them this way is that those book gills shown on the bottom photograph are very similarly constructed to what is shown in the upper part of that image, um, the upper image where you've got those folded uh, tissue where you've got blood flowing between the folds and air, um, is, or an air, well air, um, and so oxygen is extracted out of that. And there's, um, they're folded and, and flap-like, much like what the, what the horseshoe crab has, and similar for, for scorpions, and um, and crabs and lobsters and other uh, crustaceans, they don't have a structure like this at all. So the Atlantic horseshoe crab is the animal that I'm talking about, as we mentioned before, and this again is just the the range of this animal. Often when you're walking around on the shores of the estuary, you may find um, the exoskeletons of these animals. The upper left one is light colored, kind of sand colored. And that is the one that's been um, a shed. That's a shed exoskeleton if it's light colored. The one on the bottom right is dark. When you find those, it means the animal died. Um, it may have been, eaten by a predator like a great blue heron or a raccoon. Maybe um, it was captured while it was coming into shore to either to eat or to spawn. And um, sometimes they get stuck when the tide goes out and they can live for a while, but they actually are not very mobile. I've seen them get stuck in between rock crevices. Um, and of course, if I came along and it was alive, I, I helped it, but um, they, they, they sometimes get stuck in the strangest places. And so um, uh, sometimes that can, can end the life as well. So here, let's, we'll talk a little bit about their life cycle. This is something that we see frequently in certain locations in the Dermascata. Um, 
And also we see them, uh, there's an area in, in um, Brunswick, just south of us, and in Totten Bay that we have horseshoe crabs. There are some horseshoe crabs in other estuaries in Maine, but not concentrations of the population at all. In the Dermascata, we um, talk about relic populations. A relic population is a, a population of organisms that was isolated over time as a result of changing conditions. And what happens in some of our shallow inland bays, such as um, the Dermascata, which has Great Salt Bay at, at its northernmost tip, which is a shallow inland uh, tidal lagoon, actually, it, um, and it stays fairly warm. It's one reason it grows oysters pretty well as, as in addition to horseshoe crabs. Totten Bay has a similar environment. It has um, a tidal inland shallower um, uh, element to it and the estuary flows out to the ocean. So of course it's connected to the ocean so the water sloshes back and forth. Uh, there's plenty of cold water but it is somewhat warmer than the other uh, local estuaries. And so when the climate uh, uh, over over thousands of years, um, the 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 climate in this area, um, initially the oceans did cool, and so only in the warmer areas like these shallow inland bays were some of these relic populations able to eke out a living. And so we have organisms like horseshoe crabs, red chenille algae, um, oysters, and things like that that were essentially left as relic populations in some of these, these tidal inland bays. And in fact, um, that's one of the things that happened to the horseshoe crabs. Of course, this makes um, us have additional questions about, well, so are, are horseshoe crabs isolated populations at this point? And we don't actually know. At some point, we would like to do um, some studies with the University of Maine probably and take a look at the genetics of these horseshoe crabs and the horseshoe crabs in other um, areas locally and find out if they're one population or if there are some discrete populations within, within the state. Um, we don't really know that at this point. Sarah, um, but, Ger Germaine yeah. wanted to know, what about Pleasant Cove? Is that another location that has uh, similar circumstances? Um, does she mean, hi Jermaine, uh, uh, is it Pleasant Cove in the Dermascata? Because I know of a couple. I mean, it's down in Booth Bay. I think it's in the vicinity where she is, um, where she's talking about. Jermaine, if you could kindly just t type in a little further explanation <laughs> of your location of where Pleasant Cove is and we can get back to that. Um, actually, and oh, she said yes, off the Dermascata. Yeah, yeah. So that where I'm including um, that as part of the Dermascata. That's part of, that is part of the Dermascata. So there are, there is a horseshoe crab population that is throughout the estuary. Uh, and, and I should say that um, they are more towards Booth Bay in the winter time, I believe. Uh, they don't go very far, but there are horseshoe crabs that seem to congregate. Um, and some of them are pulled up in, in lobsterman's traps through the winter as well. Um, we did a small project of tagging lobsters to, some years ago now to find out where, um, did I say lobsters? I'm sorry, I meant horseshoe crabs, um, to, to find out where the horseshoe crabs do go in the winter time. And, um, and again, they don't go very far. They tend to go into the estuary, maybe into the deeper waters um, off of, of what's now Booth Bay, but they don't, they don't tend to go too far, as far as we know. Now we tagged only a very small number of horseshoe crabs, so. Were there, were there other questions you wanted to jump in with at this point or should we? Sure, yeah, yeah. We had one one other question that came a little bit, um, a couple minutes ago. Um, Chip wanted to know if there was a functional reason for the different front claws for males and females. Oh yeah, so that's a good question. So the male is actually, you can see in this picture, the male is the one on the top and um, he's actually clasping onto her um, abdomen and so and holding on and it's for you know to to outcompete the other males and they will they will kind of chain up like that sometimes there's five or seven um adult male uh horseshoe crabs on on one female which is sort of interesting because um i actually don't know uh what the um what the advantage to that would be i mean why not just move on and find a different female but um 
there there must be some advantage and maybe they do get to to fertilize some of the eggs at some point but i don't really know the answer to that so it's kind of interesting the females tend to be quite a bit bigger um they can be very big they, they're not um when i say very big i mean i've seen pictures of ones in delaware bay that get like as big as a person's torso uh, just the body not counting the telson the horseshoe crabs here in our area do not get that big. Um, they're kind of oversized dinner plate size, you know, for the most part, the females. And the males are quite, quite probably a third again is smaller um, and they don't get as big. So, so this is um, an image, uh, a couple of images of spawning horseshoe crabs uh, moving through the water. So she's looking for a place to create a nest and her nest she'll dig with her, um, digger appendages on her last legs. And um, he's looking to fertilize those eggs when they're excreted out of her body. And so, um, and he'll hang on with those funny little boxing gloves uh, for a number of hours. I've never checked to see how long they'll, they'll stay like that, but they do, they, they sometimes will stay on for quite a while. So they, what happens in the springtime is that there'll be a high tide and um, the weather has warmed up the water enough. There's apparently enough nutrients in the water and they come in from offshore a little bit and they're finding locations where they can dig a nest and um, they will um, create a little divot in the, she will create a little divot in the mud. And then um, as, um, then he'll fertilize them and, and then she'll cover it back up. And it looks kind of like a fish nest. If you've ever seen a nest of fish eggs in the water, you can walk along the shore and sometimes see them. Of course, they're really, um, they are very prone to predators, both the adults and of course the eggs at this point. So um, they don't stay around long. They, they, they try to be efficient about their egg laying and then they head back out to the water. They don't go very deep. They stay around through the summer um, and they're looking, they're foraging in, in just off, you know, in the subtitle zone, but they don't tend to come um, into the intertidal zone too much uh, throughout, throughout the summer. So this is really, the, you know, so th when I'm talking about spawning, um, at least in the Damascata, we see them very end of April a little bit, and then through the month of May and into usually their first two weeks or so of June in large numbers. And then those numbers dwindle over time through the summer. Um, so here's just another image of, you know, just spawning. And so we will, we actually, I'll talk about it a little bit um, shortly, but we have a citizen volunteer monitoring program where the folks go out and count horseshoe crabs and um, they will sometimes count many hundreds of horseshoe crabs in one area. The horseshoe crabs are specifically looking for a place where they can, um, first of all, meet up with other horseshoe crabs and secondarily where they can find a safe place to nest. And so they do kind of choose specific locations and it tends to be a place where there's mud that they can dig into um, not too uh, strong of a current because they don't want the eggs moving. I, I think they want the eggs to, excuse me, sit in that location right in the mud. Um, and uh, this does draw in predators because there's, like I said, there's, there can be a, a, a crowd of horseshoe crabs and then there's the eggs. What I see when I'm there, probably because I'm there <laughs> kind of interfering, I don't see a lot of bird life initially, but what I do see is um, the little fish, like the little killifish called mummy chugs, which our camp is named after, and also um, sticklebacks and other small, small marine fish. And they are feasting on the eggs and you can see large numbers of them. And of course that's supportive of bird life and other uh, life. So it works its way up through the food chain. The eggs, when they are um, excreted, they're, I think I have a picture in a moment. Let's see if, it, yeah. So these are pictures of the top one is the eggs. So these are like the top of a pin uh, kind of in size and they're round. They're sometimes white and sometimes um, opaque and kind of to greenish and almost blue occasionally. And you can sometimes find them already dug up by predators. So 
you, I've gone out into the salt marsh and found where maybe black ducks or other ducks were um, excavating nests and they will find, you know, you know, leave some of the eggs strewn about in the area. Um, and so they're very, very small. And then what happens is um, if they're not eaten by predators, they enter the water column once they hatch after about two weeks. And you can see the sort of the, the series of images there as to what they look like. They don't have a telson at first. They're just a little tiny horseshoe crab that's translucent. And, and as you can imagine, coming out of those tiny eggs, they're absolutely tiny. They're, you, know, you can see them with your naked eye, but only if you know they're there. And so one time I did take some horseshoe crab eggs and put them in, a, in an aquarium and, um, and I hatched them. And what happened was, uh, I put them in the aquarium and I was changing the water and kind of monitoring it and the eggs were there and they were floating around and it, I could see some changes in them but um, uh, then one day I looked at the aquarium and I thought I had killed all of them. There were like maybe 200 in there and I thought oh my gosh I killed my 200 baby horseshoe crabs but what happened was um, they ha had shed their exoskeletons very quickly after hatching. And um, so they had um, they had these little translucent shells and they were just floating on the top of the water in this aquarium. And the little tiny horseshoe crabs themselves, ever so much slightly larger, were now swimming around happily in the aquarium and eating plankton in the aquarium. And they went through this process several times over the next couple of weeks. And eventually I did um, release them because I was concerned that I wouldn't be able to continue um, taking care of them properly. And I wasn't sure that they were getting the right plankton in my tank. But anyways, it was pretty interesting. And they, they kept shedding their, their exoskeletons quite frequently. So um, just a little bit about the relationships of organisms to horseshoe crabs when they're growing and living in the environments uh, like, the, like the bays and, and estuaries around here. Um, they are homes for many. <laughs> you can see the plethora of little creatures that will live on, under, in, around horseshoe crabs. Everything from barnacles to bryzoans to algaes to two worms that attach themselves to the exoskeleton, sponges and blue mussels will adhere themselves right to the outside occasionally with their abyssal threads. Um, starfish will, small starfish will sometimes sort of hide themselves in crevices right in the horseshoe crab. Um, scale worms, the, the, the scale, like uh, 13 scaled worms. Slipper shells will attach themselves. Um, blood worms and scuds will just sort of find a little niche right inside the the book gills. And so they're like a little traveling menagerie all in and of themselves. And it's pretty fabulous when you find them. And sometimes they'll even have um, various um, uh, seaweeds and so forth attached to them as well. It's extra extra protection and, and um, a good place, a good way to hide. Um, that said, they do have predators and they are important food um, support system for the bottom image is um, a collection of red knots, which we don't see here much, but um, down in the Jersey Shore and D Delaware Bay and so forth. Th that's an image that is um, sort of quintessential when the horseshoe crabs are laying their eggs. The shorebirds are eating them just as fast as they can because they're on their migration route north. And this is an incredibly important, in fact, critical um, food source for them. Interestingly, here in Maine, the timing is just a little bit off for horseshoe crabs to be providing that sort of critical relationship in terms of sustenance for migrating shorebirds. Migrating shorebirds, um, by the time the horseshoe crabs here are really in full blown egg laying mode, um, the, the, the birds have moved on because they, as many of you know, are sort of in a race against time so that they can lay their eggs up many of them in, in tundra um, and um, tundra conditions in Canada. And they have to get their young raised before winter sets in. So they don't wait around for the horseshoe crab eggs here in Maine. But there are many other um, predators that make use, uh, including many birds, um, like I mentioned, the ducks and so forth. Um, some, of the, some of the shorebirds will, um, like semi-pollinated plovers and so forth, will um, 
find eggs. It's not quite the same kind of congregation and relationship of uh, that that they have um, just a little bit south of here. And just to mention that sea turtles um, are a um, important, we don't have as many sea turtles here, but there are sea turtles here. And um, sea turtles are a major predator of horseshoe crabs in the ocean. So let's talk a little bit about human relationship to horseshoe crabs over time. Um, the top image there, as it says, is a, a harvest of um, horseshoe crabs for fertilizer. And this is in, in Delaware. Um, the image on the right is a pickup truck full of horseshoe crabs. And I don't know when or where this was taken and I can't read the fellow's license plate, so I don't, I'm not sure. But that image actually is something that people here talk about as well. Um, there have been, um, I, I've heard folks talk about, you know, when they harvested horseshoe crabs in the Dermascata, um, they would literally be harvesting them um, by, the, by the shovel full so they would come in to spawn, folks would grab them by the shovel full, put them in the truck, and they were used um, primarily for lobster bait. Um, and that was actually, um, that ceased in uh, about 15 years ago now. And uh, there was a moratorium put by the Department of Marine Resources that now horseshoe crabs cannot be harvested. And that's been in place for some, for some 15 years or so. And we don't have um, a medical industry that's using horseshoe crabs right here in Maine, as far as I know, but no doubt many of you have heard uh, um, or even seen or been part of horseshoe crab harvesting blood um, for, um, uh, to, to use to test for various bacterial um, contamination in blood. And so those jars are the blue blood of these arthropods. Um, it's not a hemoglobin based blood like ours is um, with iron and so forth. It, it's copper based and so it's blue. It's pretty, pretty extraordinary looking. Um, and we could talk a bit more about that in, in a few minutes. But I just want to mention that there is a specific tie right now to um, this industry that is harvesting blood of horseshoe crabs because, um, and, and it's related to shorebirds, of course, um, because shorebirds in, in many places are dependent on the horseshoe crabs and the COVID-19 vaccine um, it, it has been um, in large part tested, including the one that I literally got today, the Moderna one, um, and um, it, it's being tested uh, with the use of, of horseshoe crab blood. Now there is now a, a um, synthetic that is it, um, they're just beginning to be able to produce it so that there's, it's a synthetic replacement essentially for the horseshoe crab blood. I don't know that there's been um, uh, a lot of use of it yet and I don't think it's really in production, but, and it's a fairly new um, substance, but, but that to me is hopeful that there, there are, all are alternatives that can be used instead of the horseshoe crab blood. Um, So again, this is the red knot that is so famous for being closely tied um, to the, to the uh, its migration is so closely tied to the spawning activities of horseshoe crabs in Delaware, New Jersey, and so forth. But um, our shorebirds here do access the horseshoe crab eggs. It's just not nearly as much of a um, necessity for the for the shorebirds here they find other food be, out, out of necessity because uh, the timing is a little bit off so um, this is a map it's a this is actually an old map and I should update it but um, the map shows the dermascata and it's got a number of things on it but um, it also shows the horseshoe crab monitoring locations and in the photograph is Tam Green, who's one of our volunteers. And she is walking with her staff um, along the shore in Great Salt Bay. And she is one of the, well, so I can just tell you basically what they do is they, they walk the length of, a, of an area and they usually have a partner and they are counting how many horseshoe crabs they see. And then when they walk back that same area in these known locations where we've been monitoring for about, um, close to 20 years now. Um, when they walk back, they pick up a horseshoe crab um, randomly and they um, 
measure it and they sex it and then they return it to the water. And they have a partner on shore who's who's taking notes and documenting what's being found. And so these are two of our um, sites just to give you. So one's at the Miles Hospital. So just wanted to draw your attention because the place you might have might have been. Um, so here's the Miles Hospital complex, and here's um, this is the emergency room entrance and so forth. And around this lower shore area is this is our transect line where we've been monitoring horseshoe crabs for some time. Um, and then this area on in the right hand uh, image is so 215 is um, along the shore of Great Salt Bay and up on the hill here is um, Damascotta Mills. And so for like where the alewives um, uh, go up the ladder if you've been there. But there's this area that's owned by the sanitary district here where my cursor is. And so volunteers walk out to the point and they use this area. This um, happens to be a just spot where the horseshoe crabs are um, the, every year they come there to spawn specifically. So. so our volunteers have made some really interesting um, observations, but one of the things that they do is that they um, measure the carapaces. And here you can see the difference in size um, in millimeters, the females that are, now these are spawning horseshoe crabs. So this isn't showing you any juveniles. This is only the adult spawning horseshoe crabs. And um, you can see the females are significantly larger than the males. Um, and this is just to, to document that. Um, these are looking at, so we have, um, you know, we, we always want to know, well, so when are the, what are the optimal conditions for these horseshoe crabs? And if you, if you kind of look in at the salinity and the lunar phase and the temperature, you know, what, what's the trigger for horseshoe crabs here? Well, in other places, horseshoe crabs, the primary trigger is the lunar phase. And um, so it's, you know, high tide um, at this time of year when um, the, um, at night. And um, that seems to not be the case here what seems to be the trigger for them to spawn is actually, if you look at the topmost um, chart there, it's the temperature. So when the temperature gets up about 25 degrees Celsius, that is when we see the most uh, horseshoe crab spawning. It's, um, it, it's kind of interesting because we, our population, it does point to the fact that we may have a discrete population that's different from, for example, the Delaware horseshoe crabs. And it also um, is just, it's just interesting because this is the one of the most northerly easterly sites for horseshoe crabs and so um, the fact that they are bound by temperature a little bit is is just of interest here so people always want to know so you know how are the populations are they they doing okay or not doing okay and um, so this is kind of what it looks like over time um, now the time period, you know, 2012 to 2014, we had some rough years just in terms of conditions. They don't like to come in when it rains a lot, for example, and there may have been some conditions. I haven't done um, the data analysis since um, 2014 in totality. I've done bits and pieces of it, but um, it actually does look like since that time, there has been a steady slow increase um, fortunately in the population. So we need to do some more analysis and we need to look further um, at this. So I would welcome whatever questions folks have um, and uh, we, can, we can go from there. All right, yes, we do have several questions that came in. Um, Stan wanted to know, how do you tag a horseshoe crab when it sheds its carapace? So that's a good uh, observation. So we, it was actually slipped into the, um, the shell of the horseshoe crab. And the, the fact that it was eventually shed meant that we did lose all of the tags eventually. We only needed it really to last through the winter. So the fact that it didn't last forever was okay. Um, but we, we, it was adhered inside the shell um, and eventually it did come off. 
So all right. it that's, doesn't last forever. Yeah, I was wondering the same thing too. That makes sense. All right. Yeah. Thanks for yeah, yeah. We just wanted to know where do they go? So right. we figured if we could stick those tags on in the late summer and watch them move around for a while and then watch them through the winter it would give us some information. But it was a pretty small study. So it's something that we need to repeat and sort of try to figure out what's going on now. Yeah, little little window of time there. Exactly. Um, Steve mentions, I saw one in a Museum of Natural History in India that was five feet across. Wow, that's amazing. I didn't know. I don't know anything about other species of horseshoe crabs, really. So that's pretty extraordinary. Um, Linda wanted to know, are they affected by the red tide? That's a great question. So um, they can, they, as far as I know, no, um, they they don't tend to be, so red tide, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is another um, term, sometimes we call them harmful algal blooms. There's a number of different um, chemical compounds that are part of the basic metabolic processes for some phytoplankton. So phytoplankton live in the oceans. They're basically plant-like organisms. Some of them have um, produced toxins. And uh, the one that's most famous here is, is alexandrium, and it produces a sanotoxin, which can paralyze a person who is exposed to it. It can paralyze other organisms and um, including birds. Um, and so, uh, but no, horseshoe crabs don't seem to be affected by these same toxins, which is oh. great for them. Yeah, very <laughs> interesting. Um, yeah. So you did touch on uh, some of the volunteer work with the horseshoe crab counting projects and things like that. Can you talk a little bit more about where people can find information if they're interested in um, maybe participating in that? or, or Absolutely. Yep. Involved? So our website, um, Coastal Rivers um, website, uh, Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust, if you look on there, I mean, a couple of things you could do is just if you are interested in finding out more about the program, you could just email me. Um, I, I coordinate the program. You can also look on the website for additional information. There is a description of the program and there is a 10 year report that documents some of the findings and so forth and talks in general about the, the program over time. So there's a couple there's a couple other resources there as well. Super, thank you. Um, Chip says, I'm surprised the same species lives along the entire Eastern seaboard of, and Gulf of Mexico. This covers a wide water temperature range. Are there differences in main species from Florida species, for example? Yeah, I mean, it, primarily what's been studied is this individual, this, this difference in spawning. Um, and it does seem like in other places, it's the spawning is triggered by the, um, by the lunar tides and here it's triggered by temperature as we talked about um and they, they do eat different things because there there are different organisms for them to eat in different places there are some different habits in terms of um their wintering behaviors here versus in other places some of these places don't have the same type of winter at all um and here the danger really is that they can't be feeding in the shore in the winter here because of the ice it's not just it, it's just impossible for them to get into the places where they would um not to mention the fact that um their some of the food uh, is really not available because the worms tend to go quite deep and so or out in the water depending on the worms so um so yes i would say there are significant differences uh it is they are all um, obviously the same species at this point, as far as we know, but, um, but there are some pretty big differences. And I guess I could liken it a little bit to the fact that song sparrows have different languages in different parts of the country. So, um, you know, they're all, they're all song sparrows, but they do have different habits. And that's true also for horseshoe crabs. And, and Mainers and Floridians. I mean, uh, oh, I've, lived in, I've lived in both states. So, <laughs> um, Kathy, sure. speaking of living, uh, Kathy wants to know, did you mention how long they live on average? I don't think I did, but they live about 40 years if they don't get interrupted by some, some predator. Um, so they're very long lived species. And uh, how however, oh, I just want to add that they don't, they don't reproduce until they're about um, 12 or 15 years old. And by looking at a crab, can you guess its age, assuming that it's an adult size already? Not really. They, they, um, you can't tell by looking at them. No, um, that there's some variability in terms of the, quite a bit of variability in terms of their growth. It's probably you know related to food source and temperatures. 
Okay. That, so not like tree rings, on, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> not no, something easy no. like that where you can no, just count unfortunately, it. Unfortunately, <laughs> that would be really great if, if they did have tree rings or something. Um, Nicole yeah. wants to know if you have any suggestions for places where the public can easily observe them. And I guess easily and safely observe them. Sure. Um, well, of course, uh, there may be other locations, but the ones I know about are in the Dermot Scott area because that's where I am. Um, but the, the locations that I mentioned are actually pretty accessible. Uh, the the um, sanitary district in um, along the shore there on off of 215, that's accessible to the public. There's like a chain that's strung across a um, an area, there's a little parking area and a person can just walk across the lawn there over the railroad tracks and you can get a pretty good view of the shore there. And you wanna go, um, you know, any time between May 10th and the end of the month or so is the most, uh, although often into early June is, is fine too. Um, but that's a totally accessible location. We see them pretty regularly. Um, and remember, this is high tide, so you want you want to figure out the tide, which is a little tricky in that location. I'll I'll get back to that, but um, right downtown in Damascata, where the boat where the boat dock is, the ramp behind Rennie's, um, there are often horseshoe crabs in that vicinity, and again over by Miles Hospital. So um, just don't park where the emergency vehicles are trying to park, but. Um, um, of those places you mentioned, Claire also added, and I'm not sure if this is one of those spots because I'm not familiar. She says, we see lots at the preserve across from Lincoln County newspaper. Oh, yes, is... that's true. That's There are quite a few there. And um, so that's the, we call it the Hart property or the um, Great Salt Bay Heritage Trail. And that's tr that's a good point. You can park right at Lincoln County News and it's a very short distance into the salt marsh there. Um, so you can you can check that out and often when the if you are there at lower tides you can sometimes find the shed carapaces through the summer at that at that salt marsh which is a really great trail it goes from um across lincoln county news uh there from 215 and it goes along great salt bay including that big salt marsh around under a sheep tunnel over to the middens which is um one of the biggest oyster shell middens in, on the east coast and then back um, on the other side of uh, route one so it's a really it's a really neat place yeah sounds like a great outing <laughs> it is <laughs> yeah it's about a three mile loop so just Excellent. plan plan appropriately oh and let me mention too about the tidal situation in the Dermascata because if you are coming this way to take a look at the river and the horseshoe crabs so if you are standing in downtown Dermascata Newcastle where the bridge is um, and um, the, you can check like a, a tide chart, of course, and figure And the tide charts will reference Newcastle for knowing when low and high tide is. But if you go up to Great Salt Bay, for example, which isn't far, a couple miles um, to where that salt marsh is, for example, near near um, this, either the Santerre District or the, the um, uh, Lincoln County News, the difference in tide is about an hour and a half, 45 minutes to an hour and a half after the that same tide in Newcastle because of the constraints of the river. So in a spring tide, it'll be an hour and a half difference. In a neap tide, it'll be 45 minutes difference. So just take that into account. Uh, yeah, that's important information to consider. Um, so Chip says, has have there been any studies done to evaluate the impact of pollution and runoff on populations? There have, and um, they're actually fairly res resilient creatures. Um, there have been in the Chesapeake Bay in particular, where we know that there's been a, you know, a lot of history of um, pollution, but they do um, accumulate uh, heavy metals in their system and, um, and, and they are somewhat susceptible, not surprisingly, to, to nickel and cadmium and so forth um, in particular. Um, this is a good question. How can a horseshoe crab eat a clam? <laughs> yeah, so that's it. They've got these. Um, that is a good question. So first of all, the clams they're eating tend to be not too big. But um, if you look at the underside of a horseshoe crab, the there are a number of spikes around the um, mouth. And they'll use those spikes to base macerate whatever 
they are trying to eat. So whether um, they'll use the claws to um, open up tiny clams and then they'll macerate the, the um, tissue and, and pick it off those spikes around their mouth with their little feeder claws and put it in their mouth. It's something I definitely need to see at some point. <laughs> we do, you should put up videos on your website of the. Uh, I know it's class. probably true. It's hard to watch them eat because it all happens underneath them. Yeah. So what I need to do is get like a piece of plexiglass and feed them, you know, with one. That would be a good activity for me to try, for, try that out. That would um, be amazing. Yeah, and because I imagine it would be difficult in the wild also to film it because the waters can be so muddy at times. And, exactly, you know, and they about. stir everything up because they move around and they're just in the muck. It yeah. sounds like a project, Sarah. I <laughs> think so, right, exactly. Um, David wants to know, how do you know that they live 40 years? Is that based on captive animals? Um, you know, it's a good question. Um, I don't know what it's based on. That's a, um, that's a commonly quoted number that I have to confess I took out of literature, but I don't know what this, how it was uh, determined. So I don't know that. That's fine. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is our final question for the evening, uh, and it is totally unrelated, um, but it's a good one. So Susan wants to know, did you call that tunnel under Route 1 a sheep tunnel? <laughs> yeah. So they used to herd the sheep back and forth through this big culvert. Um, and I will warn you, it's often wet. There are boards so that you can walk on, but it, don't go after a really big rain because it, it will be impassable. Um, but it is a sheep tunnel. It's about five feet high and it's a huge culvert. Um, and you can, you can walk right through there. If you're tall, you just kind of have to crouch over. But yes, that's exactly what I said. Excellent. We are learning <laughs> so much in this, uh, in this talk yeah. tonight. Yes, Kit. Sarah, this, yes, this is Kit intervening. I actually went through that tunnel today. And, oh, uh, it's uh, a bit low, but but very passable and uh, adds to the adventure. Great place. Yeah, well, I'm five um, feet I, and you're quite a bit taller, so. Yeah, that's I had to, I had to duck, but <laughs> um, but it, it does not I, I I didn't act like a sheep. I just acted like a human <laughs> and got my way through. It is a wonderful, wonderful walk. Uh, Sarah, incredible. Thank you so much. I oh. uh, I thought I knew a little something about them and now I know so much more. So it's my pleasure. Just, uh, Thanks just for quite having wonderful. me. And I think we all can wish you a um, happy horseshoe season coming up. Yes, it is. It's coming fast yeah. and we will be out there uh, counting horseshoe crabs in the very near future. We do a volunteer training at the end of the month and then uh, everybody yeah. goes out and does their thing. So we're That's looking great. forward to it. And if anyone is interested in learning more, I'd be happy to talk about it. Super. And I just uh, was reminded by a board member um, during the talk to, uh, that um, there are now trips um, with all all proper guidelines, exercise, but face-to-face -face birding trips. Starting May 1st, guess where that will be? Starting at the Belvedere Road, your education center. And it's one of the hot spots for birding and, uh, and migrant birds. So check out the uh, Mid Coast Audubon website if you want to, um, um, I shouldn't say rub elbows. No, don't rub elbows, stand six feet away, but get learn from other great birders in Mid Coast Audubon. We'd love to have you along. And thank you, and thank you, Julia, for the Camden Public Library's wonderful hosting of this event. Yes, and I yes, encourage happy everyone else. Season. Yes, and I encourage everyone to visit um, the main the Mid Coast Audubon's website is midcoast.mainaudubon.org, and you can also visit the Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust for more information, and of course the Camden Public Library program. Uh, yes. The Camden Public Library's website is librarycamden.org. Um, and as I mentioned at the top of the show, we did record this this evening. So if you'd like to share it with anyone, you can find it on the Camden Public Library program's YouTube channel. All right, everyone, I wish you a lovely and beautiful evening. Thank you again to Sarah for joining us tonight. Thank you to Kit and the Midcoast Audubon. And I hope you all have a great Thanks, evening. Sarah. See you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care. Take care.